Hello, and welcome to the Collider Podcast. I'm Collider Senior Editor Matt Goldberg, and with me is Managing Editor Adam Chipwood. Howdy, folks. Today, we have a special guest on the podcast. We are talking to director Martin Campbell. Campbell has held such films as GoldenEye, Casino Royale, and The Mask of Zorro. His latest film is The Protégé, starring Maggie Q, Michael Keaton, and Samuel L. Jackson. During our conversation with Campbell, we talked about his work on the past Bond films. We talked about the challenges of making The Protégé. We also talked a bit about Green Lantern and his thoughts about that 2011 superhero film. So it was a great conversation. We were so glad to have him on the podcast. I, I am a huge Mask of Zorro fan, so this was a thrill for me. <laughs> he del- and- Martin Campbell delighted up, lighted up when, uh, or lit up when Matt brought up the mask of Zorro. Yes. <laughs> As you maybe not, maybe you can't see, but maybe you can hear it in his voice. Um, but it was a super candid conversation. I, I super enjoyed it. I also loved the protege. It's like a throwback thriller a bit, you know, it's obviously a bit of a twist on like the atomic blonde, John wick kind of stuff. Um, but for me, a guy who loves nineties thrillers, this like hit the sweet spot. Yeah. It has that great B movie energy that you will kind of want from that film. Like I think when so many action films are just about like end of the world stakes, it's nice just to sort of be like, this is, she's, you know, assassin drama. <laughs> and, it's, yeah. and, and I think Q and Keaton in particular are great together. Yeah, no, they're incredible. And Campbell was just like game to talk about. I mean, it, he told a great story about the Bond scene that every actor uses to audition with when they're casting James Bond. Uh, you know, the struggles he had in rebooting Bond with Goldeneye, more struggles uh, with Casino Royale. Uh, you know, we talked about updating Bond for, you know, a new century. And then also got super candid about Green Lantern. Uh he just flat out said he should not have made that movie. Um, but I thought it was like a very fair assessment of, and also kind of gives you some insight into how some of these blockbusters are made. I mean, you have to remember at the time that Martin Campbell signed on to make Green Lantern, he was coming off of Casino Royale. He had Mask of Zorro, he had Goldeneye, and it was kind of like, let me try my hand at this. And then, you know, as he explains in our podcast, there were a lot of fingers in the pot and he kind of contrasts that experience of making a superhero movie for Warner Brothers with the experience of making Bond with the Bond producers. So it's a really fascinating interview, not just for Campbell, but in, you know, how some of these giant blockbusters are made. So uh, hopefully you enjoy it. Hi, Martin. Thanks for taking the time to speak with us today. Not at all. So I wanted to start off by asking, you know, you've done some great action films in your career. And I was curious, what was it about the protege that leapt out at you? Was it the story, the the opportunity for certain kinds of set pieces? What grabbed you about this project? Um, I think probably first and foremost, the story. You know, most of these um, female uh, assassin pictures and so forth. I mean, uh, the action is often great. Look at Atomic Blonde, um, movies like that. But the stories always seem to be lacking. And this one has a lot of twists and turns, a lot of surprises. Um, and uh, the relationship was the other thing between um, uh, Maggie's character and Michael Keaton's character and also with a, a kind of uh, proxy father who was, of course, uh, Sam Jackson. So it was a combination of all those things, really. And I hadn't done a female... I don't think I've ever done a female assassin story, so that combination is why I did it. Maggie Q is the best. Um, and she's just, she's incredible in this film. I was wondering what, you know, once she signed on, what kind of that collaboration was like in terms of building out that character, because it it does toe that line between, it is a female assassin film, but this is a character that has dimensionality. There's a really strong emotional core to her story and everything. And then obviously she's kicking tons of ass. So. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the thing about her and the importance in this film, as I say, is the relationship. She's a very good, she's a terrific actress as well. You know what I mean? She's, um, uh, she's excellent, I think, in the part. She also did most of the action herself, even to that jumping off the, um, you know, the top of that uh, um, foyer where she drops about four floors, four or five floors um, onto, onto the ground. Uh, she does all that herself. She's extre- Well, of course, she was in La Femme Nikita. So, I mean, probably pe- I, n- I never saw that series. I, I wasn't here, but um, people seem to uh, remember that very fondly and how good she was. Um, for me, m- more important th- than the action was just the relation, as I say, the relationship she has between the, uh, the, the, the two men, the Sam Jackson, who's the father, Michael Keaton, who is sort of, 
um, an assassin as well, if you will. Uh, so, you know, there's an element of Pritzi's Honor, the John Huston film. I don't know if you remember that, but it was an excellent film, again, with two assassins and the relationship between them. So, uh, Can you talk a little about uh, the scenes between uh, Maggie and Michael? Because they're so, they, they have fantastic chemistry. And I think the film really is electric when they're sort of, sparring together whether it's physically or with their words yeah well that relationship you know sometimes you get lucky you can't sort of create chemistry it depends on the actors themselves and in this case i think it worked um uh i think they were very well together they had the chemistry you know other times when you cast um actors in a movie or two actors the chemistry doesn't work and um who knows what the ingredient x is if you will but richard wank wrote a i thought wrote uh, a very interesting kind of uh, he, he wrote a very interesting script with those two characters um and uh, it was the relationship between them they both worked very well together um and uh, uh, it, it just fell into place, to be honest. I mean, they're b both superb actors. So uh, um, I, I suppose we we lucked out <laughs> in terms of the chemistry between them both. Well, and one of the things that I work so well that I think works so well about the film is that it's so tonally diverse. Uh, you know, it's funny, it's sexy, it's thrilling, it's scary. It's also really emotional. And I was wondering if you could talk about how you're modulating that tone throughout production and making sure each scene is hitting what it needs to hit. Because again, with those scenes between Maggie and Michael, some of those scenes are, you know, laced with tension and some of those scenes are, you know, sexy and kind of exciting. Well, laid with tension. I mean, I think the best scene between them is the one in the, um, in the restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> Where, yeah. Uh, but you know, there, there, there's a touch of mischief about the whole thing as well, particularly from Michael Keaton, um, <laughs> who is, you know, he's an extraordinary actor. I mean, he's got this weird kind of um, left field kind of um, uh, personality delivery and uh, always, always, no matter what movie he's in, is always uh, really interesting. You know, he brings something to the party that very few other actors could bring. Um, and, and really, it was just sort of going through each of the scenes, getting me certainly in the bookshop to begin with, uh, the writing helped a lot, obviously, because that kind of uh, sparring starts right from the beginning when he walks into the bookshop and, you know, is looking for a gift. And uh, But the interaction between them both uh, was really, uh, to a large extent, I think, is in the writing. And, and both of them had a, a very good grasp on their characters and the sort of um, uh, the electricity between them both you knew this was going to go right to the end of the movie so um and it's really just breaking it down uh all the scenes down getting our rehearsals um and uh just finding out um just where we needed to be in those scenes you know these sort of dynamics these the between the lead actor and the lead actress these are sort of a recurring thing in your films you know you've got the great chemistry between Antonio Banderas and Catherine Zeta Jones and Mask oh, yeah. Zorro and yeah. uh, between Daniel Craig and Ava Green and in Casino Royale is there a particular way that you sort of you know look for that or is that something that you're drawn to that sort of strong central dynamic well you know it, it, i guess it's down to casting the, the thing about zorro was um Catherine Zeta-Jones, again, who is a strong personality in herself. I mean, she's kind of that character you see in Zorro and against Banderas, the, the boy from across the tracks um, in the movie. And, and what we did was that um, it was, in fact, Spielberg who recommended um, Catherine Zeta-Jones. And I tested them. I tested th three of them in Mexico when I was down there prepping. And... I put them together with Antonio. We did, you know, we improvised some um, some scenes and very clearly it was um, Catherine who was, you know, that you could tell immediately that that was going to work. In, in the case of Daniel Craig with um, Casino Royale, Eva Green is just, I don't know if, uh, if you'd seen her before Casino Royale, but, you know, in her 
early films, her French films, I, I'd looked at those. Apart from being beautiful, she was also a um, uh, she was also a terrific actress. And and the key there is that I think it's the only time Bond ever genuinely falls in love, uh, apart from on Her Majesty's Secret Service, where he gets married and and his wife is murdered by Blofeld at the end of the movie. But the essential thing with Casino was to get Bond and Vespa together, where Bond genuinely sort of, you feel, falls in love with her, that she's not like a lot of the Bond girls, um, you know, who a Bond sort of um, gets involved with and then disposes of. Um, and, and so that, again, we, we did... Um, in fact, with Eva Green, she was very late. I think we'd started filming when we cast her. We just couldn't, um, uh, we'd tested a lot of girls. And uh, we wanted, um, the producers, myself, really wanted Eva Green. Um, and uh, anyway, finally, uh, they accepted her. And I remember doing tests with her on set. I think it was an M's apartment set and doing many takes and, Incredibly, she lost most of her French accent. You know, she, 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 she lost that. But she was a natural fit for Daniel. Again, a, again, a terrific actress. And I, I, I think the thing is in casting, you have to, you have to find, you know, whoever. In those cases, the actress, uh, both those actresses were terrific. Maggie is terrific, and I guess it's just down to. Uh, to a large extent, whoever you cast, um, whether the relationship is going to be successful or not. I'm, I'm fascinated by your Bond films because I think they're two of the best in the entire franchise. And you were tasked both times with basically restarting Bond with a new actor in the role. And going back to GoldenEye, I was kind of curious, you know, you know what, did, what was your feeling going into that film in terms of you have a new actor, you had Pierce Brosnan taking on the role, but not only that, it's Bond acknowledging that he's kind of a Cold War relic in that movie. We had big discussions about that. There was in the press, there was all that thing about Bond as past a sell by date. Don't forget, there was a seven year gap, six or seven year gap, uh, where they were not allowed to make Bond films because Peretti was running MGM. He was a crook. And, you know, it went into litigation and so forth. So Bond was not, they were not allowed to make a Bond film from the last Timothy Dalton to Goldeneye, I think it was six or seven years. And we used to sit down and talk about, well, how do we, you know, how do we get this into the 90s? And um, one was uh, obviously casting a female M, and that was based on MI6, was being run um, in London by a woman who was the Stella Remington, who was um, running MI6 at the time. So that was one thing. And the other thing we felt was that crucial scene between M, that, who, who was obviously played by Judy Dench. That was her first outing. And then there's that scene between them both where she calls him a sexist, misogynist dinosaur, which is true. And, and so in a funny way, um, we talked about that scene as answering the very question that you're asking me now. But the audience were asking themselves, you know, why is Bond relevant? Well, you know, M kicks his butt and basically says, you know, you're, you're really something out of the past, right? <laughs> and you better get your ass into gear. I mean, that was the, the, that's what we did with that. And of course, it's a kind of a Cold War story anyway at that time because of, you know, we've got the mad general and who's looking to, um, uh, to control Goldeneye and knock out all the electronic, um, you know, devices all over the world, so on and so forth. So, um, yeah. I'm curious. I mean, GoldenEye is absolutely one of the best Bond films. And I'm just curious what your relationship was to Bond when you came into that film, because it's a film that has one foot, you know, in the past in terms of the iconography, but also is forward thinking and thinking and really, I think, set Bond up to, you know, survive throughout the 90s where, you know, you had all these big effects driven spectacle movies. And, you know, Bond was something that, as you said, you know, some people felt like it was a relic from the past. Were you a Bond aficionado? Did you I was, really you know, I, I love Bond. In fact, I remember taking my mother in 1962 to see Dr. No. She was an absolute enthusiast on the books. And ironically in the books, of course, Bond, there's no humor whatsoever. And Bond drinks too much, right? So he's got a dodgy liver and he's, 
exercise. <laughs> he also smokes too much, 70 a day. Uh, there was all of this, which is in the books, if you read them, and certainly in um, Casino Royale, which was his first book in 1953. But an enthusiast, absolutely. I used to go and see every Bond film probably two or three times. So uh, I was kind of brought up with Bond, yeah. Do you have a favorite Bond film? From Russia with Love, I think, is probably my favorite. Yeah, that train fight is incredible. Well, it's not just, just, you know, it was a contained film. It was, yeah. it, it was contained. It was, um, it didn't have all the flutes and whistles and huge control rooms and, you know, um, spaceships and all that nonsense. It actually was, you know, very contained. And uh, it was, and in fact, there's an interesting ditty with this. When we test people or when we tested um, people for, Casino Royale, they always have a scene out of uh, uh, they, they, from Russia with Love that they use as a, a template. So you always do the scene. And it's simply a scene where Bond uh, comes to his hotel room. He opens the door. He takes off his coat, right? He takes off his shoulder holster, throws it on the sofa, runs his bath, senses there's someone else in the room, goes out around the balcony into his room, and there's the blonde girl from Russia with Love. Now he's got to, uh, number one, um, seduce her, but he's also going to get the information about the, um, what's it called, the code thing that they have. So it, it combines all this, you know, it's how Bond throws his coat down on the on the sofa, how he takes off his very economically and do you see what I mean it's there was and that's a scene that's always used as a um a, a, as a scene for all potential bond actors who are going to be tested having basically rebooted the franchise with golden eye and then to come back and have to reboot it again with casino royale was that daunting to say you have to reboot this but also do it in a completely different way than you did the last time we had all agreed that the the uh, golden eye Pierce had his you know continued on, and then I think it was as a result of the last Bond film before Casino got kind of ridiculous, and you know we were skiing off um, or sn snowboarding off ice flows and invisible cars, and I, I think there was an ice palace and all this. And to be honest, the two producers just felt. Um, it had gone a little too fantastic, the whole thing. They got the rights to Casino Royale. We just had to reboot the whole thing. I went back to the book. I read the books. Uh, so we were very much more in line with the books. And the idea was to just put his feet on the ground, make it grittier, make it tougher, right? And, um, and, and above all, sort of keep it in, in reality, you know, uh, so that that was pretty much you and and, and and to be honest, I didn't really have any difficulty with that. I sort of applauded it and loved the idea of um, rebooting it in that fashion. It's also, you know, a, a very tragic film. You talk about the love story that the love story in Casino Royale, I think, is is potentially the most effective in all of the Bond films. Um, and you see Bond kind of carry that trauma with him in the films after that. Uh, what? How important was it to you as you were approaching that ending of really creating kind of a almost like a, an origin, like traumatic moment for Bond that, that would was really it, strongly affect him? It was incredibly important. You know, the betrayal of that girl or who he believes betrayed him was incredibly important because it sort of, as, as you quite rightly point out, it dictates his behavior in the subsequent movies. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, Really, the emotional spine in that story is, for me, what's the most important in the whole movie. And uh, it was essential that we got that right. A, a film I absolutely love is, is Mask of Zorro. And I was curious, you know, that film, it's, it's so much fun. But also, I think it's had a real lasting impact that other 90s action films haven't had, partially because it has such a great sense of humor to it. And I was wondering if you've been surprised to sort of see that kind of the film's lasting impact in films like Pirates of the Caribbean or, or even as recently as Jungle Cruise, that sort of sense of we can do these big action scenes, but also keep that sense of humor and also a sense of pathos, really, with your, you know, especially when you see with Anthony Hopkins character, that flowing throughout the narrative. Well, the sense of humor is incredibly important, and tonally it was really important that 
Um, Banderas is a terrific actor and he understands the humor. He, he was great at playing that character. He understood it perfectly. And Catherine, the same thing. Both of them kind of have a big sense of humor as, um, as uh, people. You know, it's a touch of Errol Flynn in a f- funny way. You go back to Errol Flynn and watch um, Michael Curtiz's uh, Robin Hood, for example. Actually, Curtiz was brought on about a third of the way through the picture. They fired the other director. But the thing is, just look at the tone of those movies, right? And I watched the silent movies of Zorro, which again has that tone, perhaps a little more exaggerated, but they were brilliant films. I mean, they were superb. And I looked at all those and I very much wanted it in that tone. But of course, you know, there's a serious side to it as well. The action, I think, had to be, you know, Zorro has has this ability to not only... Uh, fight and defeat his enemies, but uh, more importantly, kind of humiliate them. You know, he has this wonderful way of embarrassing them and uh, um, his kind of skill at everything else. That, that's really what it was. So tonally, that all came really from the um, from the old silent movies, right? A lot of there are a lot of Zorro's, even the Disney series, which I think a lot of people loved. And uh, it was just really to get the tone of the thing right. And luckily I had uh, just terrific actors to be able to bring that, um, you know, to the film. When you're dealing with a, a property like that, which clearly the studio hopes to turn into a franchise, was there ever ever any pushback from the studio on on the tone? Did they want it to be more serious? Did they want it to be more fun? Was that hard no, to kind it, of modulate? It, it's interesting you should say that. The point was, when I did that film, Mark Canton was at um, uh, at Columbia, or I guess Sony, and uh, it was a film I was very reluctant to direct. I turned it down three times before I actually agreed to do it. And um, the, 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 the thing was that Canton was fired, I think, or left halfway through pre-production, and John Kelly, who I'd made um, GoldenEye with, came to take over the studio. You know, we were in a rewriting process, everything else. And I remember he rang me one day and said, I don't like this project. He says, I don't like, you know, I don't like the script I've read. I don't, it's costing too much money. You know, John Kelly was a very funny guy, but he just used to say this very bluntly. He said, I don't like it. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't give a damn whether you don't like it. The point is that cancel it, as you've got three days to cancel it, because I'm fed up with it. And 10 days later, I heard nothing and we were green lit. And I said, to him, I said to him, why did you green light this movie? And he said, well, he said, I'm already in it for 12 million. He inherited endless scripts and delays and all this crap. And uh, he, he said, uh, you know, even if it's a dog, I can get 45 million more on this. <laughs> so I'm making the film for $3 million. That was his... <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, they come back to you for the sequel. Yeah, I know. So, you know, <laughs> it was a very funny. Um, uh, um, it was a, yeah, one of those just getting the film up and running was difficult. It was budget was tight. Um, a studio that didn't really want to make it. You know, it had all those. Um, it had all of that, um, if you will, that baggage on top of it. But somehow we went to Mexico. We made it. And. You know, it was, uh, it turned out okay. I'm kind of curious because now we're in sort of this landscape where a lot of action films are superhero films and, and studios have sort of their interconnected universes. But 10 years ago, that wasn't the case. And DC only had the Christopher Nolan Batman movies. What was it like going into Green Lantern? Was Were you sort of given sort of the freedom to to create that world or were there a lot of mandates saying it has to be X, no, Y, and Z? There was, look, you know, the point about Green Lantern is, whereas with Bond, you know, I love Bond. I love the Bond films. I really enjoyed them. It was an event for me. I'm not a comic book fan. I don't, I, 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 you know, and the truth is I should never have done the film, but I did because I'd never done a comic book hero before. So, so, so I think the blame probably rests, you know, on my shoulders to, uh, to a large extent. But it was a big studio movie. The script was not up to par. Uh, we had Ryan Reynolds, terrific, obviously, and Blake Lively. At least those two got together on that movie. So we, so we did create something. Um, <laughs> the, the problem was, I remember in the last six to eight weeks of 
pre-production, every day, and I mean every day, we had meetings about cutting the budget. We need to cut the budget. We need to cut the budget. How are we going to do that? And so every goddamn day. And I'd worked out a terrific ending for that movie. And I remember I had this quite big office down in New Orleans and at the production offices. And I'd plastered the walls with storyboards. It was like wallpaper everywhere, these storyboards for the ending of the movie. And uh, they came in and said, we can't afford it. You've just got to cut it all. You have to come up with. And so in the end, it, you know, we came up with that, uh, or they came up with that crap ending that kind of was just, you know. However, you know, having said that, I should never have done it. I did it. Um, I don't think I did a good job. So for me, superhero movies, there are be better people than me to be doing those movies. <laughs> Would you mind sharing what that ending was that you originally planned? Oh, uh, to be honest, it was a huge there was a battle in the streets, right? You know, in, in, in the streets between the four lanterns, right? I mean, between our sort of heroes, right? Kilowog and Sinestro and Ryan Reynolds. However, that did not come to pass. So there we are. We know that Daniel Craig is saying that uh, No Time to Die will be his last outing. Mm -hmm. If Eon came to you and said, you've done such a great job on the last two reboots, can you reboot it again for us? Is that something that you'd want oh, yeah. to do for Bond? I would certainly consider it because I enjoy doing Bond, you know, mm. and also the two producers are great to work with. I mean, they, you're pretty much given a free hand to, you know, everybody obviously participates in the script. Um, and Casino, I had uh, Paul Haggis, who did a terrific job on the script uh, with the, you know, who did the final draft. Um, but uh, the two producers are great to work with and, um they don't interfere at all if they think you're on the right track and everything else. They just let you get on with it and uh, they support you all the way. It's it, it's a it's an enjoyable experience, you know. Well, I was curious about that kind of contrast because Bond is so important. They do kind of have these. Uh, I don't know if there are rules, but you know there are things that they feel like Bond should do and Bond shouldn't do. In contrast to something like Green Lantern, where there aren't necessarily rules, but everyone has an opinion and they want to make as much sure. money as possible yeah. and get certain sequels. I was wondering if you felt that contrast from going from one Bond franchise to this big superhero franchise, and then if you felt kind of a weight off or a freedom going back to films like The Protégé, where you kind of felt... Well, yeah, it's ready. true. I mean, look, you know, Bond is, 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 is a family affair. They protect you. They're great. You work bloody hard, but, you know, the, you are looked after by the producers. Green Lantern, it's a big lumbering studio um, production, and uh, you're obviously there are forces that you can't control, you know, uh, with the studio, with the, the, um, the opinions of the studio, and the, it, it's, a, it, it's a whole different thing. I'd never do it again, honestly. Um, but... Uh, when you get to, I mean, I've, I've done three independent films. I, I, I suppose four if you take Edge of Darkness, but I did the Jackie Chan film, The Foreigner, which again was independent, you know, and then I've done this one and I've just finished one. So, you know, all three are independent. Do you enjoy this? Do you feel that you get the uh, freedom there and sort of a, that you don't get otherwise, like with a big studio production that allows for more yeah. creativity? Yeah. Well, first of all, I have a producer, Moisha DMR, who is very protective about the film or about filming these things. And uh, you do get more freedom. You get more freedom. You have less politics. You know, they, 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 in fact, the one I've just done, we were completely left alone to go ahead and just do the film. And I didn't get a phone call from them for three and a half months. That gives you an idea <laughs> of how hands-on they were. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> well, this is this has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Congrats on the film and uh, have, a, have a great day, sir. Thanks very much indeed, guys. So once again, thank you to Martin Campbell for taking the time to speak with us. His new film is The Protégé, which will be in theaters on August 20th. Please go check it out. If you want to keep up with this podcast, you should follow us on Twitter. Adam, where can we find you on Twitter? At Adam Chitwood. You can find me at Matt Goldberg. Thanks for listening, everyone, and we'll be back with you next time.